Hey, I'm Craig Newmark. American democracy is under threat, and we all need to work together to protect the country and to protect our democracy. It's kind of like in World War II, when everyone was expected to play a role. And the first part of this is for all of us to learn a little more and to work together, strengthening American democracy, strengthening the country. The Civic Life Series is a big part of that, and the 92nd Street Y New York is the right forum for delivering all that. I appreciate your joining me. Thanks. Hi, I'm Pamela Paul, and I am so happy to be here to talk to John Judas and Rui Teixeira about their excellent new book, Where Have All the Democrats Gone? The Soul of the Party in an Age of Extremes. I just can't think of a more timely subject and important one to anyone who considers themselves a Democrat um, or should be considering themselves a Democrat despite everything. So John, Rui, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Our, our pleasure. All right. I want to focus on what's actually in the book, which you wrote uh, prior to the current events uh, mm -hmm. taking place in this country right now. So it's not up to the minute, but the subject actually is so relevant to what's going on in the news right now with Israel and Gaza and uh, the war that's going on there that it bears remarking on first. So I'm going to ask about that kind of elephant in the room before we start, and then we'll go back and talk about the book um, from the beginning. But one of the interesting things and really disturbing things um, for anyone um, on the left is that there's been this real schism um, among liberals, progressives, Democrats, um, maybe uh, the, the social Democrats of America in response to the terrorist attacks by Hamas on October 7th, where you're seeing in, um, particularly in certain venues, um, a, a response that um, is, uh, how should we say it, it's very, very sympathetic um, to the Palestinians um, and uh, the, the terrorists who currently control Gaza, um, and um, really viewing this through a lens of um, American um, discourse around colonizer and colonized, oppressor and oppressed. And it seems like this is a very unfortunate but real um, uh, example of the kind of fissures that you're seeing in the Democratic Party between the leadership um, and the elected and the uh, and the population on the left, which is exactly what you talk about in the book. So um, maybe we could start by um, you talking about how you see uh, this fissure and how does it tie into some of the issues that you describe in the book about Democrats today? Um, you want me to start? I, I wrote a book on Israel and uh, the United States, so maybe uh, maybe I should start. Look, I, I am uh, sympathetic to the Palestinians and uh, I would like to see the occupation ended. Uh, I'm not sympathetic to Hamas. I think that's a difference. I, I don't think that this is going to be a big issue in November 2024. I think the war in Ukraine is much more likely to be a, an issue uh, because by then there'll still be this enormous amount of funding, a uh, question of our resources. Um, of course, you don't know what's going to happen in the Middle East. Uh, but but again, I don't I, I would say Ukraine rather than uh, than Israel. Uh, as far as the split in the left, um, I, I, again, I think you have to distinguish between these uh, uh, longstanding groups like J Street, or if not now, which is one of my f favorites, that have opposed the occupation all along, and a, and um, you know again a, a new group of of uh, people on the far left that we talk about in our book itself in terms of immigration and race and gender that uh, take a very, very extreme absolutist positions uh, on uh, things. And in this case, in some cases, have celebrated uh, uh, what Hamas did in uh, Israel. That's a position that I don't accept. The, the guy who got uh, canceled the, at, at um, the 92nd Street Y didn't take that position, in my, my opinion, 
he took a position where he they did criticize the armed group. So, you know, again, I thought that he should have been within the discourse or debate. Uh, uh, just for reference, if, if people aren't aware, I think you're referring yeah. to Viet Tan Nguyen, um, who is a novelist who was supposed to be in conversation, right. and that conversation was postponed and then um, took place elsewhere. So, but that's the distinction I would make. Again, if people don't recognize that there was an atrocity there and that uh, Hamas is, it does bear certain resemblances, again, to this history of Islamist terrorist movements, uh, then they're really, I, I think, they, they're on the fringes. And uh, that's something that, um, again, I, I think that we should avoid and the Democrats should avoid. But then there's a healthy debate that needs to be go, go, go on about the occupation itself and about Israel's policies and about the current government. Well, I'm going to jump in um, uh, with two follow-up questions because there's a lot mm -hmm. in what you just said. <laughs> Um, one is with regard to um, uh, 2024, and you said that Ukraine, you think, will be the bigger issue. And that's an issue where there's been a little bit more of a division, a divide in the Republican Party than there has been in the Democratic Party. And so I'm curious why you think that will be the bigger issue come the 2024 election as opposed to Israel Hamas and 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 maybe why specifically for um, the um, election uh, prospects of the Democratic Party. I, I'm not, I'll turn this over to Rui after this. I'll just say yes for this because I yeah. was discussing this with a friend. I don't, um, I, I don't think that Ukraine will necessarily be a big issue, but if I had to choose between Ukraine and Israel, I'd say Ukraine because that's still going to be go going on. I, I watched a lot of uh, focus groups in 2022. Mm -hmm. And you'd be surprised at the discontent among working class Democrats and minorities about the funding for Ukraine. And why are we spending money over there? I think it is a it is a kind of underlying issue. Whether it'll be salient, whether people will vote on that basis is another question right. entirely. Um, OK, before Rui, I, I turn to you mm -hmm. or maybe you want to take this question. One of the other things, John, that you said um, is, uh, you, you know, you, it sounds to me like you don't see the split reaction on the left as necessarily that big an issue with regard to um, these events. But when I mm -hmm. think about an obvious comparison and again, there's big differences because it, with 9-11, which is what I'm going to compare it to, it was us being attacked as opposed to Israel being attacked. But in the face of that kind of terrorist attack, what you saw was not just unity on um, among Democrats, but unity between Republicans and Democrats and Democrats really supporting um, a Republican president and uh, George uh, W. Bush at the time and everyone kind of coming together and with the attack of um, Hamas on Israel on October 7th, it seemed that rather than um, America come together in uh, allyship with one of their closest um, uh, allies, instead it provoked a moment of real divisiveness, but primarily on the left. So maybe, Rui, you can talk a little bit about what you make of that, and I don't know if you think of it as a, as a, a kind of... Um, symbol of some of the divisions you discuss in the book or if it's unrelated? Yeah, I do think it's indicative. Um, I wrote about that on my Substack, The Liberal Patriot. Um, and it's definitely consistent with the argument we make in the book about the sort of, uh, you know, strength and almost hegemony of, of a certain breed of cultural radicalism in the Democratic Party, particularly among elites and activists. Uh, put it simply, the, the woker, uh, you know, a Democrat is, the more likely they are to be 150% for Palestine and, and sort of very soft in Hamas. And it's become bound up with a sort of a wide range of other uh, issues that are now sort of sort of put together. And this is what this is what the good people believe. This is what the people who are woke to the injustice of the world. These are the people who want to decolonize. We are the people who want to decolonize everything. We oppose racism everywhere. We're on the side of people of color. And that whole thing has been kind of walked into the Palestine-Israel conflict. And as a result, it's extremely common now uh, on the activist left and in the nonprofits and the foundations, good chunks of academia for a sort of 
uncritical support of the Palestinians and the Palestinian movement uh, to be joined with a multiplicity of other causes. And I think that's what's you know, sort of been walked into this division among the left. A lot of people on the left who formerly were tolerant of a lot of this radicalism is like, eh, you know, they're kids and, you know, it's kind of for a good cause and, you know, we should be tolerant. And I kind of believe all this stuff myself, sort of. Um, I think this has been a real cut point for a lot of people. When they saw people out in the street celebrating Hamas and what it did, that was just like a bridge too far. Mm -hmm. um, but I, we, we do see people... Yeah, if they're not doubling down on supporting Hamas, they're certainly doubling down on the idea that, uh, you know, the administration needs to be very, the Democrats need to be very sympathetic and really extend a hand to the people who who have said it and done these things in support of Hamas or Palestinian rights. There was a big article in Slate about how Democrats are going to damage their, their youth vote support if they don't take a more critical toward Israel stance. And I think that's indicative of, of how, again, all these issues have become jammed together uh, in certain sectors of, of the Democratic Party on its left to the point where, you know, people on the left media feel they have to warn the administration for not being tough enough on Israel because youth, you know, young people support, you know, Hamas, or if right. they don't support right. Hamas, they're very, very critical of Israel, right? So I think this is, this is bound up with exactly the kind of divisions that we talk about in the book. Now, it's complicated as substance, as, as John was outlining. But I don't think that there's any doubt that the way Palestine as an issue uh, is dealt with today uh, it is bound up a lot with the changes that have taken place in the party. And it's not the same debate we had 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, I mean, you hear all kinds of contradictory things. On the one hand, you hear that, you know, voters under 30 are in certain ways more conservative than voters under 30 were a generation ago. But I heard another statistic the other day that 40 percent of Gen Z um, is fully supportive of um, the Palestinian cause um, in its most extreme form, um, much more so than uh, older generations. So it looks like um, it is an issue in terms of uh, where the Democratic Party is heading. But on the other hand, um, one of the things that I think um, the issue illustrates is something that you talk about in the book, which is that there is, um, when you talk about the Democratic Party, it kind of, it comprises, it com includes mm -hmm. people who consider themselves moderate or centrist, people who mm -hmm. consider themselves liberals, people who consider themselves progressives um, and or very progressive, which I kind of think is is, is quite different from uh, what we tend to think of as, um, as liberals, even in the American sense of liberals, not uh, the European sense of liberals. And that on the far left or on the, that sort of progressive end of the spectrum, rather than um, an acceptance and tolerance of uh, dissent within the Demo Democratic Party, there's this approach of kind of purity that, you know, you're sort of with us or against us within the Democratic Party, um, and that the only way to accomplish that is to accept those positions in their most extreme forms, rather than to say, you know, let's focus on on where we can agree to disagree and um, and come together uh, with some kind of solidarity. And I and I guess I'm wondering if the divisions that are on display right now are a worrying signal that we're you still very mired in that, you know, very narrow kind of purity test on the left. I mean, similar to what we're seeing on the right with um, with uh, the hardline conservatives um, sort of holding the House hostage until they elected a speaker that they, uh, you know, felt mirrored their extremes. Look, yeah, I, I mean, one go thing, ahead, John. Yeah, I, I'd like to say is I'm on the left myself. I'm a two time Bernie voter. There's different kinds of lefts. And what we talk about in the book is something called the shadow party, which is foundations, media, um, policy groups. And a lot of those don't define themselves necessarily on the left. They, they might call themselves liberal, but they take a kind of uh, woke cancel culture attitude towards issues, towards uh, uh, purity on, on uh, issues of, let's say, open borders and immigration or gender or race. And that kind of, so that kind of cultural radicalism isn't necessarily historically, you know, connected to the left. It's connected as much to, you know, what we now call uh, a liberals. And we see that as a big problem 
are for the Democrats and their identification. I mean, in New York, you have the Democratic Socialists of America. That's not a group that's important uh, in 98% of the country. That's not the issue, but people do read the New York Times. People do hear about the ACLU defending a swimmer, you know, a, who was male biologically swimming in a race or something like that. So yes. those are the, that's really the way it starts to penetrate uh, politics in America. It's not through some, you know, little group demonstrating something. Yeah, I mean, um, if you were to uh, look at the Democratic Party as a whole, you mm -hmm. look at the data of what people believe who say they're affiliated with the Democrats, um, there's one group that is pretty much down the line in terms of the most extreme positions. And that's people who describe themselves as not just liberal, but very liberal. And these are overwhelmingly college educated, overwhelmingly white. Um, they live in places like New York. And these are the people who actually endorse every single litmus test that we might care to name about uh, these sort of hardline positions on cultural and other issues. Um, ordinary liberals who are in the Democratic Party are much less likely to do so. And half the Democratic Party is moderate to conservative. And they are not sympathetic to a lot of this stuff. But you'd never know that from the right. image the Democratic Party gets in a lot of these issues. And then, of course, if we're talking about the electorate as a whole, particularly the working class electorate as a whole, so many of these positions are radically divorced right. from where these people are coming from. They have like no idea what the Democrats are talking about. Uh, but nevertheless, they feel a lot of pressure to shut up about it. So uh, I think there's a lot of resentment there among those kinds of voters. But it's I just want to stress it's even mirrored within the Democratic Party. Where a lot of Democrats feel it they just speak up. All right, I'm going to pull back from uh, the most immediate current events, really talk about the book. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of divided into two big uh, parts, both of them equally interesting. And we've touched on the second part, which is um, what you call uh, this kind of cultural radicalism that's going on in, in, in various areas, whether it's uh, gender, race, identity, um, uh, immigration. Um, but I want to talk about uh, the first part of the book, uh, mm -hmm go in order here. But actually, even before that, I want to talk about an earlier book that you both uh, that you wrote together um, in 2002, The Emerging Democratic Majority, because it seems like this book is in a way a response to that. That book was very influential. And it said that, you know, the Democrats are going to uh, become a majority, right? By the end of it was the first decade or the second decade of the 21st century. First, first, first. first. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, as we can see, that did didn't quite happen. So if you could just go back, tell us what that book um, prophesized uh, in your own words and, and what, what did you go get wrong or what went wrong? Um, why aren't we dominating? You want to do that, Rui? You want me to? What's the... Why don't you kick it off and then I'll, I'll chime in. Okay. Well, we, we uh, uh, wrote this book, uh, not again as a prescription of what the Democrats could do or necessarily what we ourselves supported, but where we thought the party was headed. And we saw these groups coming into the Democratic Party over the prior 20, 30 years. Uh, women, particularly single women, uh, minorities. Again, Asian Americans uh, had not been a big Democratic group in the 90s. They did become mm -hmm. it. And I think the most controversial group that we spotted was professionals, uh, which are we're not here talking about necessarily about a surgeon. We're talking about a nurse, teachers, uh, people who have college degrees and often have one degree beyond, beyond that. And they were starting to vote Democrats. We discovered that in the Dukakis uh, uh, Bush election of 1988, that was like the first time when this group uh, went Democratic rather than Republican. Before that, they were the 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 dentists. My wife's a dentist, but that was it was called the like the that was the classic Republican dentist was the professional. No more. So that was the that was the heart of our argument. And but we also believe that the Democrats who'd retain about you know between forty and fifty percent of the working class vote that it had had, and that was the bulwark of the New Deal majority. And that's where we had problems. It looked like in 2006 and 2008 that we had gotten it exactly right. Because, you know, you get Obama and you get him winning states like Ohio, Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan, all these Rust Belt states. 
And then all of a sudden in 2010, something happens. The Democrats get slaughtered. And that was our first inkling that, mm, <laughs> you know, our, our thesis, our, while we were right about the, the, the groups that were coming in, uh, right. we we there was something missing about the group that had formerly been the heart of the Democratic Party. Yeah, basically, our thesis got bowdlerized uh, rather quickly in the discourse. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Obama's victory in 2008 really reinforced that interpretation. Uh, what these guys are saying is like demographics is destiny. Yeah. The groups that are growing are demo pro-democratic. The groups that are declining aren't. You know, all we got to do is like, press the accelerator on our politics and just have faith that everything's going to move in our direction. And, hey, look what happened with Obama. Um, right. But, you know, what people didn't realize there and didn't understand about our thesis is a central role that in, in terms of just pure political arithmetic, we ascribe to retaining strength among the white working class, particularly in key areas of the country. Uh, that was pretty much forgotten very quickly. And in 2008, people did not take as much notice as they should have that Obama actually did pretty well, relatively speaking, among white working class voters, particularly right. in the Midwest. Um, and then in 2010, as John's pointing out, you know, the, the, the anvil fell on the Democratic Party and white working class voters bailed out in droves. Um, and that was part of the reason, good part of the reason why they got hammered so badly. Then in 2012, Obama manages to get reelection. And a lot of that, again, is because he brought back white working class voters in the Midwest. He ran a kind of populist campaign. Romney was a great target. Um, but that was completely ignored in the aftermath, where it was ascribed to, you know, the rising American electorate has delivered right. another victory for, for Democrats. So all we've got to do is keep on going. And they completely forgot about this key part of the election and obviously had, you know, forgotten for many years about a key part of our thesis. And then, of course, once you get to 2016, it becomes apparent this problem with the white working class broadly speaking, is is a huge one, and it can bite back. And in fact, you can lose the presidency because of it. And, and not to fast forward too much to other parts of our thesis, but eventually, uh, and now we're starting to see non-white working class yeah. voters bail out. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm going to forget about the forgotten man for one more question uh, and, and address that last point, because I think that is one of the most baffling things to people on the left and to Democrats is, um, given what we thought was um, all of the demographic trends going in uh, in our direction, it was how could we possibly have lost Latinos, Asian Americans, and Black people in this country? And in particular, not just, you know, in, 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 the, in 2016 that many of people in those groups voted for Donald Trump, but then an he increased his percentage among all of those groups in 2020. And, um, you know, people think, well, how is that possible? We're the party of diversity. We're the ones who have created this big tent for various ethnicities and identity groups. Um, how are they going over to the other side? Um, so can you just talk a little bit, and then we will get back to the forgotten man and, and, and to uh, working class Americans, which is uh, a big part of the focus group of your book. But um, part of it, as I think you rightly point out, is that th these groups are not as simple as uh, the terms terms like um, BIPOC or Latinx or, um, you know, Asian American Pacific Islander would suggest. What did we what, what happened there? Well, I do think the 2020 election should have been the, the big wake up call of this this problem. I mean, yeah, it was a little bit disconcerting. Democrats didn't do better than they did in 2016 among, you know, non-whites, particularly Hispanics. But 2020, as you point out, there was actually big shifts in the direction of Trump. So after four years of Trump, you know, the racist, bad orange man, how is it even possible that he would increase his support among and big time among Hispanics? There was a shift of around. 60 margin points toward the Democrats among Hispanics, and it took place all over the all over the country. Um, you know, what's that about? Well, I think, as you're alluding to, a lot of it was just mistaking, you know, their vision of Hispanics for the reality of Hispanics. I mean, Hispanics are not sort of people of color who are very, you know, primarily concerned about what a racist society America is. And, you know, their big issue is immigration. That's about it. They're basically overwhelmingly working class you know, upwardly mobile, 
you know, moderate to conservative people who uh, just want a better life. And they thought right. Democrats were more on their side than the other guys. Um, once you start losing that, uh, and once they start feeling Democrats are concerned about a lot of other issues, I don't give a good gosh darn about, um, and are much more culturally left than I am, it, it, it opens the door to the Republicans, including a Republican like Trump. And that's exactly what happened. And again, I mean, this, this, this move away from the Democrats was concentrated among working class Hispanic voters. That's really what drove it more so than the college educated, which are not that large a group within Hispanics anyway. Um, so yeah, no, this is, this is a big deal. And, uh, you know, the Democrats now on net, on in aggregate, lose the working class vote to the Republicans. And that's not only because white working class voters have been voting for a while against the Republicans, but now with the attrition among working class non-whites, you wind up with a majority working class people voting Republican. And boy, that should raise big questions uh, in any Democrat about where the party's going. Yeah, I... Um... I, I discovered that there was a problem myself in 2014. I was in San, San Antonio. My wife had a dental convention there, and I looked into the uh, governor's race. Well, Wendy Davis, who was the can candidate, um, I think, to the lady in tennis shoes or something that she was described as, she was the main uh, uh, pro pro abortion rights person in the Texas legislature, was running against Abbott, who was a, you know, real hardline conservative guy um, on Medicaid, all these kind of issues, uh, the kind of guy you would expect, again, Hispanics to vote against. And uh, they had this group, Battle group, Battleground Texas, that Obama people organized that uh, was going to win Texas on the Hispanic vote. And I talked to a guy who was a community organizer in San Antonio, and he said, no, she's not there, you know, abortion candidate there, you know, she's going right. to lose the Hispanic vote. And indeed, she lost male Hispanics slightly ahead among female and lost all these counties that later would be the by, you know, again, to people's amazement, uh, Trump would take. And yeah. uh, again, the, the like the immigration issue. In general, Hispanics have a ver the very same uh, views as uh, other people in the country on this issue. They're not uh, pro, uh, they don't want open borders. They're worried about border security. In some cases in Texas, they're more worried about border security than, uh, th than other groups in the country. So again, I think de Democrats had a very idealized view of uh, of of Hispanics that partly reflected again uh, that the party and the party's intelligentsia was so concentrated in these big high tech uh, finance yeah. university cities where the main experience people had were uh, uh, people I hate to say this you know maids roofers things like that this is great you know. <laughs> and they didn't realize right. uh, what the experience of people in small towns and mid-sized towns um, where, you know, again, costs were going up, uh, where they the workers felt threatened and so on and so on and so forth. So it was a real uh, uh, it, it was a, it was a re real error on part of the Democrats not to understand this. And I think it reflected the way the party itself had changed over the 20 and 30 years. Right. Uh, so that, the again, the people just didn't see the problem. There is a a really interesting uh, documentary um, online on HBO right now um, by Nancy Pelosi's daughter, Alexandra Pelosi, called The Insurrectionist Next Door, that, um, in which she interviews several of the people who were prosecuted on January 6th, and at least three of them are Hispanic. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it definitely goes against uh, people's expectations of, of who that Trump voter is is. Um, let's go to um, The Forgotten Man. And one of the great things uh, that you do in your book is you you go back in history, um, mostly it, really in the 20th century, to talk about um, the uh, how the Democrats lost their original greatest coalition uh, strength, which you date back to um, the New Deal Democrats when we the last time we had um, real unity and force in the party. And I, I don't want to have you go through uh, the entirety of the book, but maybe you can talk about a couple of the big moments that explain how we got from the strength of that group to where we are today. 
Well, let, let, let me try, and then we can fill in the parts I leave, leave out. Uh, it does go in stages, and you have to think about it archaeologically, which is to say the first stage remains, and so you don't have... Uh, so civil rights, huge issue in the 60s. And then, then I, I'd say the key election is 1972, where Nixon slaughters McGovern. And you have three issues. You have the backlash against civil rights and the increase in welfare through the uh, uh, Great Society, where, again, white middle class sees itself as paying for other people and not getting any benefits themselves. Uh, you get the counterculture, acid amnesty and abortion, and the amnesty part, again, the war, nationalism, patriotism. So again, that's a big, that those that cluster of issues um, really damages the Democrats. And the whole Wallace, George Wallace segregationist vote in 1968 goes over to Nixon. So if, and if you add those two together, you get pretty much the Nixon route of McGovern. Second stage, economic stagnation against uh, in, in the 70s with Carter. Uh, Reagan comes in, the misery index. We have to get rid of the unemployment and inflation. But all, also at the same time, you get the decline of the unions, which really starts in the 1970s. The unions are incredibly important for the Democratic Party. In the 40s and 50s, about a third of the families in America are union families. They vote a union. They follow the ideas of the New Deal and of the New Deal pro programs. They're the main donors to Democratic candidates and they're the main activists. They start to decline, largely under assault by a, this kind of coalition of Republicans and K Street lobbyists. That's when you get Washington chain becomes an enormous lobbying commu community. Uh, as they decline, the party itself starts to change. The party becomes more dominated by, on the one hand, its donor groups, uh, which Silicon Valley, Wall Street, Hollywood, and on the other hand, by the new left organizations, environmental, feminist, civil rights, but not again the core economic issues. They start to disappear. So you get in the 90s, this second stage, where the Democrats do these things like NAFTA, uh, China and the WTO, deregulation of finance, uh, telecommunications, all of which bite back and hurt the working class. And the Democrats get blamed for them, even though the Republicans supported a lot of those measures also. So that's the thing of that is the second stage. Final stage, 2010s, the cultural radicalism. And that culminates really in the uh, Hillary Clinton uh, losing to Trump and the idea that the country is divided between us and the deplorables. And it really reinforces the idea of that, that there is, that there are, which is, you know, part of the product of our economy, these two different parts of the country, two different ways of life. And the part of the country that doesn't support uh, the way of life of the big cities and the and uh, uh, ends up voting for Trump. And to our amazement, you know, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, I mean, all, all again, Ohio, all these all mm -hmm. these states that were Democratic go for Trump. I mean, it's interesting because when people talk about the Democratic Party, they often say, oh, you know, the Democratic Party takes for granted that black people will vote for them, that minorities will vote for them, that women will vote for them. Um, but it sounds like what you're saying is um, the group that we've really taken for granted has been the white working class voters, because the assumption has been since Democratic Party, Democratic uh, policies would seem to benefit those people ostensibly um, mm. that that they would vote for us, they would vote in their economic interests. But that is, it sounds like you're saying that's really the group that we've lost. Yeah, well, yeah, think, no, that was that was an assumption. Uh, and right. I think interestingly related to that is the concept that, well, of course, our policies are in the interests of the working class, so they right. should vote for us. And if they don't, that must mean they are, to use that phrase, deplorables. They're just they're racist. Uh, they they are they are really not 
the right people we want voting for us anyway. Right. So there was a real um, uh, sort of blasé attitude toward losing working class votes. Um, we're still promulgating policies in their interests. And if they don't vote for us, it's just because they're reactionaries. And there's nothing we can do about that. So I think that that has a huge influence on the way Democrats view these surges of working class voters, particularly white working class voters, obviously. And then I think even recently among non-white working class voters, if they're not voting for us, it's because they are sort of beyond the pale. They they are right. they are prey to misinformation, manipulation, and outright racism promulgated by the Republican Party. We don't want those people. Anyway, and I think back to the thread John said about labor, I think it's just so important the way labor's influence and the sort of whole New Deal ethos um, loses influence in the Democratic Party. Because as it does, labor was sort of a bulwark against yeah. that kind of approach to things, that kind of approach to the working class, that kind of approach to cultural issues. And as their influence wanes, it just increases the influence of the people in the shadow party that we've described. And not only are there more college educated voters, liberal college educated voters for the Democrats, they're occupying all the positions of power. They're defining the image and, and priorities of the Democratic Party. And that, again, pushes pushes the party away from taking uh, the concerns of the working class seriously. So um, it's that's part of the, the, the winding path that got us to where we are, but I do think underlying it is exactly what you say, Pamela, taking for granted that working class people must, you know, vote or should vote or eventually will vote for the working class party, us, the Democrats. And that turns out not to be true. Let, um, let me give you one example of where, where it was striking to me. After uh, uh, Obamacare passed, it was this idea, well, this is going to win the Democrats uh, all these votes. But Instead, there was this incredible backlash. Starts in 2010, major thing in 2014. And I didn't understand it myself. I mean, I thought, well, you know, they're paying for, you know, the people, again, resentment that they're paying for other people. And I talked to my healthcare experts, and it turned out that the way that the plan itself was written, again, in cooperation with the insurance companies, the hospital industry, was that people who made, let's say, less than $50,000 or $60,000 a year had their policy subsidized. After that, they didn't. So actually, all these people were experiencing this big jump in their premiums. The Obama people said, well, you're going to, you know, you would have experienced a bigger one. But again, not taken into account, completely right. missed. And so you get this enormous revolt in 2010 and 2014 election elections against Obamacare. So uh, again, not not thinking about it. And that runs through the democratic policies from pretty much from 1978, when Carter gives in to the Republicans on capital gains, reduce the change, starts to change the tax policies through Clinton and through Obama. Policies that really don't benefit the middle class and they, you know, revolt. So right. there yeah, you I go. Thought that the part on on Carter and the, the the mistakes that he made was very were, was really interesting um, uh, and uh, kind of these fatal errors for the for the party. I want to go back to labor um, quickly, but first, just to follow up on something, Rui, that you said. I mean, is the Democratic Party led by people who can afford to be progressive and liberal? Um, you know, there's a, always this battle of who's the party of the elites, right? For a long mm -hmm. time, it was Republicans because they were supposed to be the establishment and big business. Um, and now uh, it's it's maybe the Democrats uh, just as much as Republicans because the Democratic Party can afford to advocate for something like, um, you know, open borders because they are not largely on the borders. They are, do not have jobs that are necessarily threatened by um, immigrants coming in and, and possibly taking their jobs. Or as you say, with Obamacare, um, they're not in that bracket um, uh, economically where uh, they, you know, they're, they're hit by initially by an increase in fees and they're not the ones who uh, are buying electric cars and can afford solar panels. I mean, is it that, the Democratic, uh, the, either the shadow party and the the, the ruling party have little mm. at stake um, or have have to put little at stake for some of these uh, very progressive stance that they take on these issues? Sure. I think that's a big part of it. I mean, as you say, they can afford to have these kind of 
super tolerant attitudes toward issues around crime and immigration. They can afford to put a high priority on some of these cultural issues. They can afford to promulgate gender ideology and race essentialism and a lot of other things because, you know, that's that's what they want. Right. Uh, and the extent there's blowback and, and bad outcomes that obtain from these, they're really not affected by it too much. Um, so, yeah, I mean, they, they basically they run run the show at this point. And because they run the show and because they're somewhat insulated from uh, the negative parts of, of whatever it is, the policies they do promulgate, um, it's sort of a self-perpetuating hegemony. <laughs> uh, and it does put them out of touch with the working class. It does put them out of touch with normie voters, as I sometimes put it. And again, you know, sort of this is not just white working class voters at this point. It's increasingly working class voters of all races and ethnicities who are starting to feel like, you know, not the Democrats don't understand me. They're out of touch with where I'm coming from. They seem to care about a lot of stuff that I think is complete baloney. And, uh, you know, they're they're basically it's kind of there was this phrase in the 60s, limousine liberals. Right. Yes, and I yeah. think limousine liberals are back. Yeah. <laughs> and I think working class people aren't happy. Um, I mean, the, the classic was defund the police. Right. I mean, we had a big movement among these left groups in the, in our county to uh, um, <clears throat> get the police out of the uh, schools. And I told my daughter, uh, who had gone to school here and we're not in the most upscale neighborhood, she said, really? I mean, kids used to bring guns into the school. So they finally convinced the city council to our county council to to get the police out of the uh, schools. And what happened? Like in the next month, there was a shooting. And now the police are back at the schools. But it's again, I wonder about these people. Do they live in gated communities? I right. mean, where do they get these ideas that they want to uh, defund the police? And you saw that in. Uh, Minneapolis and all these places where the actually the black residents wanted more funding for the yes. police. They didn't want discrimination. They didn't want police brutality, but they didn't certainly didn't want to defund. So I thought that was the really classic example of where the people were just uh, it was either young people who just didn't experience that kind of thing or people who were who lived in, you know, Mamaroneck rather right. than uh, Queens. Uh, I mean so. <laughs> I lived in Central Harlem for a decade um, in a in a community in Central Harlem it was 92 or 94 percent black at the time. And mm -hmm. um, the people in my block association who were largely black um, could not want the I mean, they wanted the police on our block more. They wanted there to be um, right. a, a greater presence. They wanted more uh, attention paid um, to uh, to uh, street crime. So, um, OK, I want to go very quickly, touch back on labor because uh, we're, mm -hmm. we're running out of time um, and then ask you one final question. So on labor, just moving forward right now, it seems like, oh, there's a little bit of a, a, a renaissance, a revival of organized labor. We've seen some um, action on the part of uh, United Auto Workers. There was a situation with the railroads. There's lots of unionizing efforts. Um, maybe more among uh college educated uh groups certainly in, workers, yeah <laughs> yeah in the media um of course uh not so much maybe in um places like uh warehouses and and uh in in more blue collar jobs but there it there seems like there's a spirit of renewed energy around organized labor is that going to help things or is that is that is it not significant enough i'm not sure yet the, a lot of it is very defensive. The, yeah. the, the United Auto Workers is really, uh, I mean, they've been screwed by all the foreign companies coming in and relocate and locating their plants in right to work states where it's very difficult to organize. So they have only a slice now of, of, of the auto workers and people do that. So that, this is a really a defensive operation on their part. And I, I hope it wins. Uh, the others, as you note, are among a lot. A lot of these uh, are among professionals. I think the key one is to watch is the Amazon warehouse workers and the Teamsters. But so far, that has not been a, a success. 
the labor laws are so difficult to get around. I mean, Starbucks, you know, people were going crazy. We've organized Starbucks, but they're blocking it and they can delay this thing for years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, with a place like Starbucks, all the employees will be gone by then. It'll be, uh, it's like a body renewing itself after seven years. So we're still in a very difficult position. And yeah. what we really need is a party that gets 60 votes, can beat cloture, and can change our labor laws to make it easier, not more difficult uh, to organize. Obama had the chance to do that. And his billionaire friends from uh, Chicago came in and said, don't do that. Don't make that a priority. And he didn't. But he should have because that would have changed the party. OK, one last question. Um, this is such an excellent book. Um, uh, and um, the obvious question is, why are there not more books like this? Um, there are so many books right now in the last five years uh, have been about the Republican Party. What's gone wrong? Where are conservatives? How has it gone off the rails? What does Trumpism mean? When will it end? Um, and there really has not been as much of uh, a companion uh, degree of self-examination on the Democratic Party side. And I, I'm wondering if, you know, is it, are we afraid of self-criticism? Are we so terrified of Republicans that we don't want to address um, these divisions and, and, and sort of are pretending that it doesn't exist? Why are Democrats afraid to talk about the issues that you um, raise so well in your book? Well, I think it's like the stories that people like to tell, <laughs> the stories that Democrats like to tell about themselves and their party is we're the good guys, the other side of the deplorables. Um, we stand for all the right things. Uh, I, you know, we can't imagine and even understand how people could vote for the other side against us when the other side is so awful, when the party Republicans have been Trumpized and MAGAized and all the conservatives are, are crazy. And if that's the case, and there's no need for us to compromise on anything, really. We just have to make sure we get the right people out uh, at the elections. And we need to just keep the fire trained 100% on the other side. And I'm not examining the obvious question here, which is, well, OK, if the other side is so bad, if they are so crazy, if they are in disarray, why can't you beat them you know, more yeah. decisively? Right. You know, where are the 60 Senate seats? Where are the big victories up and down the ticket. Um, how did Trump almost win again in, in 2020? Why was yeah. 2022 another stalemate election? Why would we look like we're going into yet another in 2024? Um, whatever one says about the Democrats, one cannot plausibly say they are the dominant majority party now, but shouldn't they be given the other side uh, and what it stands for and what it says? Um, that's sort of behind what you know, why we wrote the book is trying to understand that and sort of where is the party that America needs that can speak to a broad majority of the American people and can form a dominant political coalition. And, uh, you know, I think it's very easy for Democrats uh, to think, you know, just basically talk trash about the other side. Right. They're uh, so they bad. Hate them. So... They're tribalized. You know, those those are the other team. Uh, but I don't think that's productive in political terms. Uh, John, I'll leave you, uh, give you the last word. Um, how are you feeling about 2024, given the current state of our party or the Democratic Party and the Republican Party? I, I'm really worried about it. And uh, the the way the elections have been decided for the last, oh, I don't know how many years is that both parties have these extremes. If the election is about the nut, nuts in the uh, <laughs> Republican Party, then we're in good shape. 2022, 2018, 2020, to a great extent, with Trump and his handling of COVID. If they're about the R extremes, if they're about to def defund the police or wh whatever, then we're in trouble. And uh, you know, we have a, the Democrats don't have a strong bench. I think if, if I had to be objective about it, the Republicans have a stronger bench. They have more magnetic, younger figures that are, are national pol politicians that I may not agree with. But again, um, I think the Democrats really have a problem uh, in terms of uh, who's going to inherit the leadership of the party after Joe Biden. So, yeah, I'm worried about uh, 2024. 
All right, I have. Uh, we've totally run out of time. That was what that noise meant. Um, uh, the book again is "Where Have All the Democrats Gone?" The Soul of the Party in the Age of Extremes. Um, maybe this will light a fire under the left. Um, I hope so. Um, John Judas, Rui Teixeira, thank you both so much for writing this book and for discussing it with me. Thank you, Pamela. Yeah, that was great. 